This episode is brought to you by Cryptid Crate and Mac Weldon. Prepare to confiscate the human's possessions. Possession secured. Prepare the probe. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a hot second. No need for a probe, man. Why are you doing this anyway? To learn from your kind. And to obtain your container of treasures. Container of treasures? Oh, you mean my cryptid crate? Yes, the cryptid crate you possess. We desire it. We have discovered it to be populated with many objects we find most incredible. Correct. The objects in this container cannot be produced on our home planet. Well, you don't have to abduct people to get your own cryptid crate. Elaborate. Just go to cryptidcrate.com and sign up. On the first of each month, a new box filled with amazing cryptozoology-themed items will come to your mailbox, or spaceship. Allow us to show appreciation to you, human, for this invaluable information. Yeah, sure thing. Does this mean you're going to take me back to Earth? <laughs> Not exactly. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. I want to thank you all for coming back for yet another awesome episode. And I have one heck of a show lined up for you guys this evening. But before we get started, I wanted to touch on this briefly. Uh, as anyone that's listened to the past two episodes have probably realized, I'm trying a bit of a different format here. Instead of the normally scripted show that I put out, I've been trying something uh, a little different. I've been doing what I call a live show. I have no script, I have a handful of notes, and I have the stories, and we kind of go from there. Uh, the feedback's been pretty great on these last two episodes, so I think I'm going to try it again. So today's episode will also be a bit of a live episode. And now if you guys out there are uh, not big fans of this, or you know you like the old way better, simply shoot us a message on Facebook somewhere, and uh, let me know, you know, which of these two versions you like. This version certainly takes a lot less time than the scripted version. But, um, you know, it's up to you guys. Whatever you feel like you enjoy the most, shoot me an email, shoot me a, a message on Facebook or Instagram. Let me know what you guys think, uh, which one of these two versions you like the most. And I think that's what I'll go with in the, in the future. In addition to the slight format change, this will be the first episode that is sponsored. So you're going to get an ad in the middle of the show here, but you know, you got to remember these these ads keep the lights on here. They keep me doing the show. So please support the sponsors at the very least. Check out their website and see if it's a, a product that you like. So uh, just wanted to let everyone know that that's most likely going to be taking place. Maybe not every episode, but uh, at least every few episodes. Okay, so we got all that crap out of the way. Now let's get into the spooky stuff. Our first call of the evening comes to us from Paulina in the state of Pennsylvania. Hi, my name is Paulina. Um, I live in Northeast Pennsylvania. The story is actually in Northern New Jersey, so that's about the state county, uh, Sussex County. Um, I'm not sure on the year because it's been so long, uh, but I would say in the early 2000s, so anywhere between maybe 99 to about 2003, 2004. Um, so this is at the Wigwayanda State Park in New Jersey, um, up 
send an email with an exact location. Uh, but as far as weather, the clouds were, there was no clouds, it was clear, it was really nice out actually during the summer. Um, the sky was blue, you could pretty much see anything in the sky and it would stick out. Uh, terrain, um, really not much terrain, there's a lot of trees, but I was laying in my parents' van and I was reading a book. I stopped for a second and I just happened to look outside the window in the sky. And when I did that, I saw a round, dark object. I don't know what it was. Nothing came to my mind as far as exactly what it was at that moment. And until a series later, I figured I had a UFO. Um, but I saw this dark black circle in the sky and I thought it was weird because it had a reflection from the sun you could see it and it was so far but I could see the reflection and it was just a small black dot almost really um, we used to go to that park all the time I've never seen anything weird I mean I've had my fair share of weird experiences growing up but I smell people go stuff and not really anything that I would bring up nothing significant but so that's my story um, I know it's not much, but I hope it helps, and I will attach a picture of the exact location. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Paulina. Now, I went ahead and posted the pin that Paulina forwarded to me on today's show notes for this episode, so you can go to monstersamonguspodcast.com and check that out. Uh, you know, I fully expected to find a military base or or even a regional airport uh, in close proximity to the location that this sighting took place. But to my surprise, I didn't see a single military installment uh, shy of a recruiting office anywhere near this place. And in addition, I found one airport, the Sussex Airport, but it it appears to be very small and unlikely to uh, have the capabilities for a, a aircraft that size to take off. So I'm not real sure what it is that Paulina was looking at in this particular instance, but, you know, perhaps if anyone that lives in that area uh, has some insight, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us on on any social media or email and let us know maybe if you have a theory as to what she possibly saw that evening. Uh, So thank you again, Paulina, for taking the time to share that call. Now our next call is uh, one from a little further away. The following is Rob's call from the U.K., Uh, hello, my name's Rob. Um, just want to say uh, I love the podcast. It's brilliant. Um, I've been binge listening to it for probably about a week now, and um, I'm going to be so upset when I run out of, any, of episodes and have to wait a week for each one. Um, but yeah, so uh, my story uh, is something that happened to my sister. Um, probably about 15 years ago now Um, she hates talking about it she only ever told me once and uh, that's it Um, she has no interest in the paranormal really and she would never make something like this up Um, and in my opinion it's it's quite scary Uh, but yeah here it is so um, so yeah, probably about 15 years ago, uh, my sister used to ride horses with a friend. Um, this took place in Bolton, uh, which is uh, just just north of Manchester in England. And um, she went on a horse ride with a friend, and it was evening, going dark. And um, by the time they reached this this hill, well, it was a field, but it was on an incline. And they were walking up this up this hill. Uh, it was pretty much dark. Um, so as they were walking up, the horses that they were riding uh, just stopped totally still. Um, their ears pricked up and they just would not move. And these horses were looking straight up to the top of this hill. And, um, yeah... Uh, and so my sister and her friends 
looked up to the top of the hill and uh, they saw a cloaked figure um, and my sister said that its cloak was moving in the wind and it had this kind of crusty white face and uh, kind of grey wispy hair and so all of a sudden this thing uh, just started moving down the hill towards them and of course the horses um, turned around and absolutely bolted like they were galloping down this hill and um, my sister said that she she turned around behind her and she could see this thing right behind the horse uh, staring at her um, and this is all while the horses were galloping and the horses uh, went through a river and apparently this thing just went straight over the river and um, and the horses jumped over a wall into a housing estate with street lights and she said that this thing just stopped on top of this wall and then just dissipated into thin air um, and so my sister and her friend rang their respective dads uh, and my dad and her dad came down to the farm and met them where they kept the horses. Uh, they separated the two girls into different rooms, uh, took a story from each of them, and the stories matched up. Um, and they were inconsolable. They were just so... Uh, just crying. Um, just really, really upset. Uh, and so my dad was... Um, he was off work at the time. He had a, a well. He was recovering from a, a broken leg from a motorcycle accident, and uh, he went to the to this farm where this thing happened. Uh, he went on the field, and he could. He said that he could see um, the hoof prints of the horses, and he, he said that he could see where they walked up to, where they stopped, turned around, and galloped back down because obviously you can tell from the depth of the print um, how fast the thing was moving uh, so yeah and so he saw those and he said that he, he couldn't see any uh, bicycle tracks or motorbike tracks or anything or even any footprints but I mean yeah everyone knows that no one can keep up with a galloping horse just running uh, so that's pretty strange. And so my dad spoke to the owner of the farm uh, where this happened, and he said he'd he'd never seen anything um, really. But he said there was one time when um, when he was a kid, he went with his friend to collect conkers at the bottom of this hill. I think it might have been in the housing estate. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but yeah, so he he was picking conkers on this this woman's garden, and this old woman came out of the house and told him and his friend to to get lost, basically um, get off her garden. And so they did. And then the next day they came back, and some workmen were uh, demolishing the house. And so they said to the these builders, like, "There's an old woman that lives in here." Um, do you, do you know about that? And they said, well, there's not been an old woman living in here for years now. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what, what he saw, if, if she was some kind of ghost or whatever. But I would say that um, I'm I'm a sceptic. I've, I've never seen anything uh, paranormal or anything like that. Um, I mean, I kind of want to believe, but at the same time, I, I just can't bring myself to... Um, unless I actually see something and that's not happened yet so I'm open to it but it's never happened to me um, yeah as I said my sister's she's really trustworthy she has no interest in that kind of stuff and she would never want to, to make it up but she's very clearly distressed by it and yes yeah, it's just something she told me a few years ago and it's just stuck with me um, so yeah a bit of a weird one uh, but yeah uh, thanks for making the podcast. I absolutely love it. And um, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Rob. Now, for the American listeners out there, uh, a conker is like a horse chestnut or other tree nut uh, that is often gathered uh, over in the UK. So that's that's what he's talking about there. I thought that was an important thing to, uh, to touch on. Now, uh, this story, even though it has nothing really to do with uh, what I'm about to say, jogged this memory for me, and it was a bit of a pleasant one. So when I was a kid, I was obsessed with the book Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. And in one of those particular books, there was a story, I believe it was called Bessie. So in this story, there was a farmer that was um, had this horse that he was in love with. And he was the perfect horse. She was gentle, great to ride, whatever. You know, whatever it is people see in horses. So uh, as a gag, he goes to see a fortune teller. And the fortune teller tells him that his favorite horse, Bessie, would eventually kill him. And she recommended that he get rid of the horse. So he debated this for a while, and, and it kind of dwelled on him to the point where he decided to sell the horse. So that's what he did. And a few years pass, and that's when he learns of uh, Bessie's death. So he decides to go to her resting place. Now, I don't know how it is everywhere else, but growing up, uh, I knew people with horses. And a lot of times when a horse would die... Um, as bad as this sounds, it's, they would just leave it where it was, uh, especially if it was back, you know, in the back pasture or something, because they weigh so much and it's so difficult to move them. Sometimes they would throw some dirt on them, but a lot of times they were just left to kind of be dissolved by nature, you know, the beetles, the birds, and all that stuff. So I, I guess this is the case here. He goes to, to visit her resting place and he sees her skull sitting there. So uh, he reaches down and kind of pats her skull and that's when a rattlesnake pops out of the eye socket and bites his hand and, and he doesn't he doesn't make it so ultimately the horse did kill him I was in love with that story as a kid I, I guess it was just the mention of horses in this call that brought it up but I thought it was uh, a fun little thing to mention there but what I do like about this call is the fact that uh, the father interviewed the two uh, witnesses separately he certainly sounds like a proper investigator uh, I, I really enjoyed that that portion of it. And as far as what was witnessed, uh, to me, to me, it could easily just be an old man in a cloak. So there are eccentric people everywhere. Who's to say that there isn't some old hermit or recluse living in that area that, for some strange reason, wears a hooded cloak everywhere he goes? Uh, this could explain the ashen face and the cloak itself. Uh, but it certainly wouldn't explain how the entity was able to cover as much ground as it did without uh, leaving tracks and, and doing so so quickly. Uh, so that certainly puts a wrinkle in that little theory there. You know, it's, it's certainly not the first uh, cloaked figure sighting to be reported, and not even the first uh, reported cloaked figure sighting on this show. So it's quite possible that there's something, you know, bigger going on here. But uh, I want to thank you, Rob, for taking the time to call this story in. I really enjoy getting calls from overseas. It definitely puts a new perspective on some of these stories that we share here. So thank you again, Rob, for taking the time. And our next story comes to us from a very familiar voice. The following is Isaac's call from the state of Florida. Hello, Derek. This is Isaac calling again from uh, Central Florida. I got another story for you. Um, this is this one's from my childhood, and it, it's not a, not my story. I didn't witness this. This is the story of of one of my good friends. Um, I'm gonna call him Mike uh, for sake of anonymity. I don't really know if he would um, want me to <laughs> tell this tell a story, but um, anyway. Uh, when we were kids, um, Mike had an experience um, at his home that's pretty amazing, and I thought that you know other people might you know want to hear about it, so I'll try to get through it quick before my get, get cut off. Um, we, he lived in a single wide trailer um, in rural central Florida, um, out in the cut as we'd call it, out in the sticks. Um, he lived down a country road. And, um, you know, his little trailer sat off the side of the road right around the curb. And, you know, um, you know, like the front of your yard is mowed, you know, where you have a little area there to pull your cars up and everything. But, you know, the backyard, you know, it's mowed to an extent, and then it goes out a little ways, and that's where the woods start. 
And, um, you know, right along the wood line, you know, around here, there's big palmetto bushes and things like that. Well, um, Mike was, he was around eight or nine years old, and he was laying in his room one night, on a school night, you know, he told to go to bed, so he's laying there, you know, in his bed, just hanging out. Uh, his room was in the middle of the mobile home. It was the middle bedroom. You know, most mobile homes would have, like, a master bedroom, a kitchen, a living room, a hallway with a middle room, and then an end room. Well, um, he's in the middle room, and his room is facing the backyard, you know, toward the wood line. So, you know, he's a little, you know, he's laying there, and, you know, a little kid, you know, just peeking out the window, looking around the backyard. And he peeks down the blind and looks over, and he, there's, a, there's a light pole a little ways off the back porch. There's a, well, not like the porch, but where the steps come down. And there's a light pole there that illuminates the backyard. And, you know, you can see the, the clothesline out, out back and everything. And right there underneath that light pole was a big palmetto bush. And he says that he, he pulls, picks the blinds down. And standing in his backyard is this little man. Um, he said he was three or four foot tall. He looked like he was wearing some kind of suit that squared off his shoulders. Um, large, oversized head, um, bald. Um, but he, he, his back was to him at a way. He was kind of sitting at an angle where he could almost kind of see his profile, like from the back. And he says that his little hands are in the bushes fidgeting with something, like it was, um, I don't know, he said it was hard to describe what it was doing. Like he was, he was working with his hands on something. And, you know, he's shocked to see this, and he's sitting here, you know, looking at his, peeping out of the blinds, looking at this little guy. And he said he looked at him for, you know, a minute or so, and then, it was like this thing knew it was being looked at because he said he stopped what it was doing and it slowly started to turn its head towards him. You know, so he lets the blind go, you know, he's like, you know, hell no, you know, I'm not, not looking at this thing. You know, he's, he's scared. And he said that he, he, you know, he laid there thinking about what to do. And after a few minutes, he, and he got his courage back up. So he peeks down the blind again and looks and it's still there. And it's standing there doing what it's doing. But this time, it didn't take it as long to start turning its head to look. And so, you know, he lets go of the blind again. He said at this point he's terrified and his heart's racing. And he knows that, you know, if he looks again, it's going to be right there at the window staring at him. All right. Now, I believe his story. Number one, he was, he's my friend. But number two, I mean, when he's telling me this story, the emotion in his eyes, the tears welling up, you know, those feelings coming back. You can tell when someone's lying. And when someone's get to honestly telling you something they saw, I mean, for all the crazy stories I have in my childhood, you know, I can appreciate, you know, someone seeing something crazy. So anyway, and he finally gets the courage to look again. And he says when he peeks down that blind, when he pu pu pulls it apart with his fingers, that this time it's still standing in the same place, but it quickly turns its head. And he says that when he sees its face, its eye sockets are hollow, this black holes. And there was no nose, it was very smooth, and there was no mouth. It was um, uh, this large, white, bulbous head with hollow eyes. And so, you, you know, he at this point, he's totally freaking out. So he just, you know, jumps off the bed, and he's got to run for his parents. And, you know, he says he, he tears off down the hallway, but then he realizes that where the back door to the mobile home is, there's a window in that back door, and it would have been right there behind that back door. So it, it was like instinct that he said, you know, he, he dove on the ground and kind of commando crawled across the living room so he wouldn't have to look out the window. And he frantically crawls up and starts beating on the his parents' door. And, um, you know, they let him in, and he's like, turn on the lights, turn on the lights, and everything. And um, anyway, uh, his stepdad goes outside, you know, of course, you know, these things go. He doesn't see anything. Um, you know, parents don't necessarily, necessarily believe him. Um, but he said the next day um, he went out there to the backyard, 
and to see if maybe he saw anything that you know could explain it or could have been something else but there was nothing there um and um that's a story of the creature he saw in his backyard man um i don't know i got some theories but you know i'd like to know what you uh, what you think or if anyone else has you know got something similar um like i said i appreciate the show i'll be coming back with some more stories um see you later Thank you, Isaac. Now, this call includes something that I enjoy uh, hearing in other calls. Basically, it's uh, the description of whatever creature this is that we're looking at is preoccupied with something. Sometimes you hear this with um, Bigfoot encounters, and I can think of one particular one I believe came out of the state of Mississippi, and if you were to search uh, help, I think I saw a skunk ape uh, on YouTube, you'll see this video, and I'll link to it in the show notes as well. Uh, but basically, the the skunk ape in that supposed skunk ape in that uh, video was pulling bark from a tree to, I assume, get to grubs or other insects that may be living, you know, within the wood. But this uh, this particular instance from Isaac here is is very similar. That the creature was doing something in the palmetto, whether it was foraging for insects or maybe collecting water that was that was trapped in the plant who knows what it was doing but the fact that it was preoccupied with something uh, to me lends a lot of credence to uh, to the sighting uh, it wasn't just simply walking by or standing there or, or looking at them it was preoccupied with something and not only that but it went back to this after it it first saw the it first saw Isaac's friend there the other thing that pops out at me uh, regarding this call is the fact that it sounds so similar to a creature that we already know about. And of course I'm talking about the Dover Demon. Uh, The Dover Demon was described as uh, three to four feet tall with tanned of peach colored skin, no nose, no mouth, a bulbous head, and and I believe it had glowing eyes. Now the only difference that I can find in Isaac's account and the classic uh, reports of the Dover Demon are the eyes. Uh, Of course Isaac describes them as being hollow and... uh, Bill Bartlett and the others that saw uh, the demon in 77 described it as, I believe, having glowing red eyes, if I remember correctly, something I probably should have looked up. But, uh, you know, those those encounters took place in Dover, Massachusetts, and, of course, uh, Isaac's call took place in Florida. But if this is a widespread cryptid of some sort, I could definitely see it traveling. There's no reason to say it couldn't, especially if you start throwing around the extraterrestrial moniker. Uh, I believe it's very possible. Now, as an added bonus, I was listening to a podcast called Bizarre States, uh, which is a very good show. I highly recommend you guys check it out. It also drops every Thursday, just like my show. But uh, a few weeks ago, on an episode called Sick Beats, they uh, featured a listener story that sounds very similar to what Isaac experienced. And uh, I hope they don't mind, but I'm going to steal a little clip from their show. And uh, this is what they talked about. All right, so hi, Jess and Bowser. My name is Kelly, and my story is about a spooky Christmas Eve I had a few years back. That evening was unusually warm and foggy for December in Massachusetts and felt more like Halloween than Christmas Eve. My mom was busy cooking pies for Christmas dinner when the power suddenly went out. I suggested that we call my aunt, who lives nearby, to see if she still had power so that my mom could finish the pies at her house. Fortunately, she did, and we rushed over there to continue baking. My mom finished up her pies and we made our way home. As we were driving, the person in front of us suddenly put on their brakes as if they had seen something in the road. It is a very rural area and wildlife in the road is not uncommon. However, this was not something that I had ever seen. Sprinting in front of our car, I saw a tan-colored being about four feet tall running on two legs. It had a huge bulbous head and an impossibly skinny body with unnaturally thin arms and legs. It was moving incredibly fast and I only saw it for a few seconds. If I had been by myself, I would have thought I had imagined the entire thing, but my mom instantly turned to me before I said a word and said, Did you see that? We had both seen the exact same thing. We spent the rest of the ride home talking about what we'd seen and could not come up with any rational explanation for it. It moved so unnaturally fast and it was just so odd-looking. The only thing that it reminded me of 
was the classic representation of the grays, adding grays. When she she right. has it in quotes, she's talking about the uh, gray aliens with the big heads and the big eyes. Yeah. Adding to the oddness of the evening was the fact that there were police and firefighters blocking off some of the roads around our house. Supposed, supposedly, this was because of downed power lines, which sounds reasonable enough, but in lieu of what we just saw, all I could think about was that maybe a UFO crashed and there was an injured alien running around the neighborhood. We repeated the story to the rest of my family when we returned home, who, of course, thought we were crazy and didn't believe us. However, a few days later, my mom was telling the story to a friend when he replied, Well, you saw the Dover Demon. I had never heard of the Dover Demon and was surprised when looking up info about it that it closely matched what we had seen. It is a creature that was spotted a few times in Dover, Massachusetts in the 70s. We live very close to Dover, so geographically it could make sense. She sent us a link to check it out. Uh, anyway, that's my story. I hope you like it. Love the podcast and keep up the good work. Now, as you can probably hear, there's certainly a similarity between what the witness on um, Bizarre States witnessed and what Isaac's friend saw. Uh, so you can probably see the correlation there. And again, go check out Bizarre States. Uh, if you like my show, I, I have a feeling you'll like their uh, uh, more humorous but uh, equally as interesting program. But uh, thank you again, Isaac, for taking the time to share that secondhand experience. Now before we move on to the next call, I want to tell you guys a little bit about today's sponsor. If you're sitting in front of your phone or computer, I want you to visit MacWeldon.com. That's M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N.com. Now when Mac Weldon approached me for an ad, my first thought was, who's going to buy underwear from a podcast? But that was before I visited their website. They have some downright amazing items. The first products that caught my eye were their line of accessories. As someone that does a fair amount of traveling and camping, I found their line of backpacks, bags, and wallets very attractive. Now get this, many of these items include portable phone and tablet chargers. So imagine keeping your phone charged the entire flight using only your wallet. But the fun doesn't stop there. Their clothing line is also top notch. Mack Weldon puts a lot of thought and research into each of their products. And here's a selling point that certainly caught my attention. Mack Weldon has a silver line that includes shirts, underwear, and socks. And I'm certainly not talking about the color. But what does it mean exactly? Well, simply put, Mack Weldon puts real silver into the fabric, resulting in a natural antimicrobial and anti-odor clothing line that will keep you cool and dry all day long. So now you don't have to smell like a skunk ape while you're out there looking for a skunk ape. And here's the best part of all of this. If you're not completely satisfied with your pair, Mack Weldon will refund you the full purchase price, no questions asked. And now, for a limited time, Mack Weldon is offering 20% off of your first order by using promo code MAU at checkout, and that's exclusively for Monsters Among Us fans. So just visit www.macweldon.com and remember that promo code MAU. Now, back to your regularly scheduled program. Our next call comes to us from what I believe is a man named Bear Maker. It gets a little jumbled there, but uh, whoever he is, is a cool little story. Hi, this is Bodaway, also known as the Bear Maker. I was around the Lance Indian Reservation in the UP Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I was driving my car, and, I, and then I got out to throw the dog a stick. Anyway, I heard this. I heard this really long roar. I've never seen anything like it. I've been in the woods my entire life. I thought it was bear, but I threw the stick to the dog, and the dog started barking. Um, I went outside, I went to look, and it was awful smell coming around the corner. All of a sudden, I see this big, hairy man ate this thing. It scared the living f- out of me. So I decided to call you guys. Um, I don't know what you want me to do about this thing. I just got my car and left. Um, told some of the locals, um, just seemed to laugh. So I started to get this herd. Maybe get it out up here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to my story. I hope you consider it and believe it. Thank you for that call. I really feel like I should have found this one right when it happened because it sounds like the gentleman called immediately after his experience. So I did a little research uh, as far as Bigfoot sightings in the UP, and uh, apparently there have been enough sightings that uh, Animal Planet's Finding Bigfoot made a trip up there. And for more on that, Here's a clip from ABC 10 of Upper Peninsula. 
The Upper Peninsula has a lot of Bigfoot sightings. Bigfoot enthusiasts came to the Brownstone Inn in Ah Train a few weeks ago to tell their Bigfoot stories and experiences to Animal Planet's Finding Bigfoot crew. You're not surprised that Finding Bigfoot decided to come up here and do a show about Bigfoot in the UP? No, I figured it was about time. Stories ranged from incidents happening this past summer just miles from the Brownstone to sightings that happened 25 years ago outside of Munising. I wasn't a bit surprised at all that people saw Bigfoots nearby because like, if you go half a mile that way, you're in the middle of nothing, basically. Other possible sightings have occurred all across the central UP, stretching from near the Sinu Wildlife Refuge to Escanaba and the Hannaville Indian Reservation. A and B reports are divided as to how much doubt there could be. Like if you saw a large shadowy figure in the the dark could probably be class B, but if you saw a figure at 30 yards at daylight that was eight feet tall and covered in hair, that's definitely class A because there's very little room for misidentification. The Finding Bigfoot crew isn't surprised that there have been Bigfoot sightings in the UP. I know for a fact that squatches exist. I've seen it myself on the West Coast and I come here, it's perfect habitat. Obviously it has to do with the amount of wildlife in the area as well as the amount of habitat that's available, particularly for large mammals like Sasquatches or moose or anything else really. From the people on the reservation alone, I mean, there's, there, geez, got to be a hundred stories. I mean, just a lot of them. From talking to the local UP Bigfoot investigators, they're not up in this part too much in the winter. They're on the south shore more where it's a little warmer. They'll stay in those cedar swamps in the interior. This time of the year, it's a great environment. It's why the other animals are here, why there's so many deer and rabbits, that sort of stuff. There's a lot of food. Only a handful of people told their stories to the crew, but others who attended believe Bigfoot is real and wanted to hear about people's experiences. I try to listen to other people. I have not had any experiences of myself with Sasquatch just yet, but I hope to uh, in the near future. Uh, at this time, I'm still listening to what other people have to say, uh, whether or not I can determine if they are real or not. Um, but as of right now, I'm keeping an open ear of what people have to say. The Finding Bigfoot crew will now visit these sites and try to find evidence of Sasquatches living in the UP. We've narrowed it down to three separate witnesses and we're going to go to each of their locations and try to determine the authenticity and also try to learn as much as possible about the encounter. Um, usually we find that people are telling the truth. There's no doubt about that. For ABC 10 and CW5 News Now, I'm Molly Smirka. Thank you again for taking the time to share that call. And of course, it goes without saying that you should probably report that sighting to a site like the BFRO or uh, maybe a local Bigfoot investigation team up in uh, the UP area. Uh, that always seems to, to help out research in, in local areas. But uh, thank you again for taking the time. Our next call tells us about a legend that uh, I frankly was not aware of. The following call is Stephanie's. Hi, this is Stephanie, and um, I've probably supplied you with about three stories so far. Um, this one will be my fourth. Um, I recently found the podcast, I want to say a couple months ago, so I'm kind of binge listening to them. And I ran into one story uh, from Carrie. And she was in season three, episode four, about her driving um, from... I believe it was Nevada to, Re to Las Vegas or Reno to Las Vegas or something like that. And she had encountered this giant bird-like thing that uh, she couldn't explain. And I remember you saying that you didn't know what it was either. Now, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if uh, you've got, gathered any new information about this from any other listeners, but actually what she described is a Mexican Tejano type legend, which is uh, La Lechuza. And um, what that, that translate to is, in, from, from Spanish to English, it's um, the, the barn app. And the legend on that is that there was this, there's, there's this witch that can basically take form uh, into a barn owl. And, um, and it's not just a regular sized barn owl, it is a huge human-like owl. And I actually have two stories that kind of, uh, that collaborate with that. My cousin was on his way to Rando, Texas, from Houston, Texas, which we're from. And um, it was, and the way, the road that we take, I'm not sure what 
what high it is, um, but it's this long, dark road. And um, while he was halfway asleep, um, his his uncle was driving, and all of a sudden they said, "Oh my God!" And he immediately woke up and catched a glimpse of this giant black bird, huge, huge black bird. And before they could even get get near it with their car, it flew. And the wingspan of it covered the entire windshield, which is what um, what La Lechuza's description is, giant, giant wings. And the fact that it covered from one side of the windshield to the other was just, it was terrifying for him. Um, and I also had another cousin who was walking one day, same same place, she's in Texas, and he saw this giant bird underneath the street light. And some of the legend says that uh La Lechusa, if you if you um whistles at you, you're not supposed to whistle back or it'll come to you and scratch your eyes out. Well, he saw this giant bird underneath this street light and he heard it whistle. And he heard, so I guess not remembering the legend, what you're not supposed to do, he whistled at it back. And it just took off. It flew and it never did anything to him. But um, I just wanted to kind of give you more information and more insight on what she saw. And you can actually uh, Google it. It's a pretty uh, popular um, legend in Mexican and Texas, um, the Mexico and Texas. And it's spelled L-A space L-E-C-H-U-Z-A, La Lechuza. Well, I hope this uh, information kind of helps you a little a little bit, and um, her story just sparked my story, and hopefully it'll spark some more from 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 this thing. Um, thanks. Thank you for sharing that call, Stephanie. Now, coincidentally, I've also received uh, the following call from the UK that may help shed some light on some of these other strange uh, bird sightings. Uh, so here is that call. Hey Derek, long time listener here from the UK, first time sending anything in. Appreciating the fantastic platform you've created for these experiences, I felt it was high time I attempted to contribute. First of all, I'd like to speak with regards to a couple of recent stories you've had involving birds and missing time. The account stirred a memory of similar stories I'd previously heard or read, and I've done a little bit of investigating and see us on the internet for everyone else to look at. And whether it's connected or not, it might give those callers some lines of inquiry. These relate to experiences with large, unnatural owls in particular, and how they are synonymous with the alien abduction phenomena. I don't know too much about the idea, however it would appear that some of those investigating this phenomena find those that claim abductee have regularly claimed stories of strange owl sightings which will only strike them as such after the fact. Parts of these stories will relay that they are unnaturally large, or maybe that they are in unusual places, such as staring at them through a screen door at their home. The idea developed behind this is that they have come to understand these sightings as screen memories and by that I mean memories which have been placed there to obscure the reality of what they had actually seen. In this respect, whilst these alien beings did not possess the ability to wipe their minds clean of the abduction, they can warp these experiences into something more acceptable to their minds. The missing time of your previous callers in this respect would be that time which they spent with whatever it was. I don't know enough about the idea to continue further, how well felt it bore some relation to the recent caller's stories. It's obviously quite a dive into the paranormal also, however, I felt it an unnerving, yet entertaining idea of, that you might like to feature. My second reason for calling was to follow up on the interest you might have expressed in the large cat phenomenon. I haven't always lived in the big city and have a story originating from my original home in a pretty rural location which might pique your interest. So I used to have a friend who lived on a farm as a child and I would often visit to hang around the land. And I'll proceed this with a story about the night before I head over there for a day. I was in my nearby home when I woke to the sound of heavy purring which I could hear from my second story window. I didn't rise to take a look, however shortly after there was what sounded like every bird in the immediate area taking flight and shrieking. It was quite strange and I will say that growing up I have had sleep paralysis 
and maybe this was some early indication of that. Although I don't have much auditory hallucinations, more seeing things. Anyway, I'll continue with what happened the next day. Once I headed over to the farm the next day, there was more evidence that something strange was going on. Upon greeting me, my friend and his parents immediately took me to the side of their house and showed me a large footprint which had appeared overnight in the mud. It was certainly that of a large cat and one wouldn't find this out of place on a farm, however this one was big. Much larger than a domesticated animal, it was also clear that an imprint that you'd expect something of some weight to have left it there as it had pushed it down into the mud. In addition to this, they showed me where something had visited a truck full of feed that they kept for the animals. The back of the truck was slightly open in that something could have got in, however the evidence came where it had jumped back out. The floor below the truck was made up of large stones that covered the area as a surface gravel. The stones were not small enough that they could be pushed around easily, and where something had jumped out you could see clearly where two legs had gone down like that of a cat and they had pushed all these stones into sizable piles. I can't think of any other animal in the UK, let alone in my local area, which could have left these signs of a creature having been there. It's certainly better evidence than what happened to me the night before, seeing as it was there for everyone to see. And it wouldn't be the first time that somebody in the area had said they'd seen something. I know that people on farms around the area had also said that they'd actually seen big black cats. Either way, I thought you'd find it very interesting. And my belief is that these cats are probably out there. I know there's stories from the UK back in the maybe 60s, 70s, where people used to keep these things in their houses or in cages. And when it became illegal to do so, they just let them out into the wild. And who knows, maybe some of them are still hanging around there to this day. I'll finish up there. Although I do have a ghost story from my youth, I will probably call back with in a short while. I'll have to get my thoughts together and submit it for you to tell everyone. Thank you very much for everyone listening to this story. Keep up the good work. I want to thank you both for taking the time to call in and share your input on these strange bird sightings. Uh, But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next call. But thank you again so much. And also... In the interest of time, I'm going to skip all the announcements. So follow the Facebook page, buy stuff from the store, uh, rate and review the show, share it with friends, and visit CryptoGrade. Okay, with that out of the way, we're going to move on to Dave in Canada. Hey Derek, this is Dave calling from Canada. I'm a relatively new listener to your show, but I absolutely love it, and uh, I've really been wanting to call in and tell you this story, so I'm going to get right into it. So this happened to me about uh, 10 years ago, so about 2007, 2008 in the spring, and like I said, I'm from Canada, specifically I'm from the province of Alberta, that's as general as I'll get, but um, this incident took place place at um there's a very popular lake just outside of the major city that i lived in and this took place on that lake in uh there's a whole bunch of cabin little towns you know where people have their cabins and they go out there uh every summer and that's really an albertan kind of vacation in a nutshell really popular around here so anyway um i went out to this cabin with two friends who I'm going to call B and C. And C and his family own this cabin. Um, Now, when I say cabin, it's a pretty big stretch. Most Albertan cabins are a trailer parked, you know, on a lake lot that becomes permanently fixed there, and they call that their cabin. So that's what this was. Um, And yeah, like I said, C's family owned this cabin. Um, he had never ever mentioned anything about anything weird, you know, ever happening there before. Um, but anyway, so this trailer cabin had a layout sort of like this. You would come in the door to your left. You would see the kitchen and the, um, dining room area. 
and it would go down a hallway and there'd be a bathroom and two bedrooms. And on your right would be the open living room and there was a couch. The back of it was facing, you know, the door and it faced towards the opposite wall, which had a large old TV on the left hand side. And on the right hand side of the room was um, a wood stove. And it's one of those, you know, a black kind of pear shaped that has a big flue going up and out. And it had the big door on the front with the glass window, which has that big cast iron handle. And it has like a gold knob on the end that's like made out of spiraling metal, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so that was the layout of this cabin. So, you know, we had got there fairly early in the day and he had been showing us around. C had been showing B and I around. Um, you know, the back room was one of his old rooms and he had all these, you know, stuffy plush toys, everything from teddy bears to this talking Homer Simpson doll. And uh, we were all just sort of hanging out, talking, just really chilling. It was a pretty average, you know, spring kind of day. And uh, so evening had rolled around and uh, it wasn't particularly nice out that evening. So we decided we're just going to sit inside and we were watching some old VHS on this old TV. I cannot even remember what. And so it's at about this point where the incident happened. And I just want to pretext this by saying all this, what happened, it took place over, you know, the span of three or four minutes. It was fairly quick and shocking. But so here's what happened. I'm sitting on the couch. And uh, I've got C sitting next to me on the left-hand side. So I'm on the right-hand side of the couch. Um, and my buddy B, he is laying on the floor uh, in front of the couch, and he had used his backpack as a pillow. Don't ask me why. <laughs> That's just what he did. Um, and we were there hanging out. We had a fire going in the wood stove. I had started it myself, and... And uh, I'd used, you know, the big box of red bird matches that every cabin has. And I struck up the fire earlier. And yeah, so we had been sitting there, fires going nice, um, watching this movie, whatever it was, I can't remember. And so all of a sudden, we hear the Homer doll say something back from C's room. And I, I don't remember what, if it was doe or another, you know, classic phrase, but I kind of looked at... C, and I, I noticed B kind of sat up a little bit, but then he laid back down, and we were just like, kind of gave each other that look, you know, like, weird. And uh, I look back at the TV, and so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the TV, and so it wasn't quite in my peripheral vision. It was just into my vision, the wood stove. And I see, so after I lit this fire, I should say, I you have to close the hatch door of this wood stove and you have to crank this handle all the way up and a little bit to the left in order to lock and you got to give it a good amount of you know force and you got to close it so anyway so just in my vision uh i see this handle move an inch to the right and i hear it go Err! and at the exact moment that this happened you know i turn and i look directly at the fireplace wood stove and the handle falls it swings all the way open the door swings straight open and the fire was it was like coming out at us like not like 10 feet at us but you know like a, a foot out of the fire stove um and it was roaring like like when you blow on a fire like roaring roaring and I guess instinctively C jumps straight up, runs over and slams this thing shut. Meanwhile, B jumps up off the floor and we all stare at each other, all white faced. And C goes, let's go outside. And we go, yeah. And we start making a line for the door. And so it went exactly like this. C walks out the screen door. I walk out immediately behind him. He's holding the door for me. I'm holding the door for B. I let go. B has one foot out the door and he goes, oh, I forgot my cigarettes. He turns around, stops dead in the doorway and I hear him go, oh my God, scream it. And he runs in. We run in after him. <laughs> His backpack, the handle, that's the strap, pardon me, was on fire and there were struck red bird matches 
laying beside it on the ground, and B was stomping it, stomping it to put it out. And it was the most unbelievable thing that's ever happened to me, um, <laughs> to say the least. It was, I just, we all had no idea what to do or think, and we just sort of stood there for a moment. Then there's one more weird part before we finally fled the cabin. As we are standing there, we came to the decision that we are not staying here anymore tonight. We're going to drive back because it's not very far, like an hour. And B picks up his backpack, and we get a look at this burn on the floor where his strap had been lit on fire. And it, it looked like a symbol. That's like the best way I can describe it. It was almost a hieroglyph meets like a cuneiform. Like if you've ever seen old Sumerian or Babylonian writings, how they did this sort of cuneiform symbol, but almost an image as well. And it was really, really bizarre. I contacted both B and C to see if either of them had a photo because I know for sure one of them took one when we right before we left, but neither of them said they had it. So I'm not sure whatever happened to it or maybe I'm just mistaken I thought there was one but but yeah so one more little thing I'm just going to add in because this is just what I've thought about over the years after this the whole idea of fire and this sort of hieroglyph symbol makes me think about the aboriginal peoples of Alberta the reason I say that is because this lake um, it's known that you know, Aboriginal tribes populated that area for probably thousands of years before, um, you know, white people came over and settled around there. So I, I wonder if it has something, some connection to that. I mean, I honestly, I don't know for sure, obviously, but it's just always kind of been a thought. And um, yeah, and also C, um, yeah, he, he said that, you know, they had never had a paranormal experience there ever, and his family had owned this place for like 20 years. Nothing had ever happened before. This was the only time, and uh, I don't see him very regularly at all, to say the least, anymore, but we occasionally, you know, are in contact, and uh, as far as I know, nothing has ever, ever happened again. Um, so yeah, so that's my story. Thanks for letting me tell it. And uh, I, again, I love the podcast. It's absolutely amazing. And keep doing what you're doing. Um, I have a few other like, you know, weird little stories that aren't quite as good that maybe I'll send in to you sometime. But uh, anyway, thanks a lot, Derek. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Dave, for submitting that call. Now, my first thought here was the following. When I grew up, uh, my parents used a wood stove to heat our house. It was a small metal box we kept in the basement with pipes running all throughout the house that would distribute heat. I noticed some weird things with that we called the wood burner. Uh, We noticed some really weird things, like the handle would move on its own, or it would make a lot of ticking sounds. And basically what this equated to was the metal heating up as the fire raged within. And uh, as the the metal expanded slightly, it would move the handle, or it would turn a knob here. It It would do weird things. So I'm not at all surprised to hear that the handle on this particular device moved, especially if there was a roaring fire within uh, that would rapidly increase the heat on that unit. So that part I can easily write off as a coincidence or, you know, laws of physics. But it gets a, a little harder to explain when you mention the fact that there was a book of matches and a backpack on the floor engulfed in flames. That's a lot harder to explain. But what it does remind me of is... Uh, Something I don't believe I've touched on uh, yet on the show, so I'm going to play a quick clip from our friends over at Unexplained Mysteries. Is spontaneous human combustion real? You be the judge. In December 2010, 76-year-old Michael Faherty died in his living room in Galway, Ireland. His death was very unusual. His corpse was totally burned, but the fire damage was limited only to his body and the floor and ceiling above it. There was no clear cause of the fire. After a forensic investigation, The coroner recorded Fahardy's death as a case of spontaneous human combustion, yet no one knows what causes spontaneous human combustion. For every person who dismisses it as unreal, someone else believes it as a supernatural phenomenon. Could spontaneous human combustion be real? 
Flaherty's death is similar to other cases. The FBI investigated the mysterious death of Mary Reeser in 1951. The 67-year-old was found incinerated along with her chair. Only her foot, her spine, and her strangely shrunken skull remained. The other furniture in her room and the building itself was undamaged. Like Mary Reeser and Michael Faherty, victims are always alone when they burn. There are no witnesses. Usually the body is completely destroyed by the flames except for the hands and feet or lower limbs. Fire damage is nearly always limited to the bodies and there is no evidence of the victims being near a naked flame. The only fuels provided by the human body are fat and methane gas. For the body to reduce to ashes, it needs to reach an estimated temperature of over 1600 degrees Celsius. We would expect significant damage to the environment from that level of heat. The term spontaneous human combustion, or SHC, was coined in the mid 18th century, but the first known account of SHC is from 1641. In August 2012, biologist Brian J. Ford offered a subtly more scientific spin on the theory. He says that alcoholism, diabetes, or a diet low in carbohydrates can lead to a buildup of acetone in the body. Acetone is highly flammable. Ford says the legs and arms tend to survive because these parts of the body have the least fat and therefore store the least acetone. That said, he did not offer an explanation for what sparks the combustion. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that spontaneous human combustion is at fault here. Uh, it just, frankly, I thought it was a good opportunity to share a phenomenon that I otherwise uh, most likely would not uh, be able to discuss on the show. So, uh, with that out of the way, I want to thank you again, Dave, for taking the time to share that bizarre uh, story with us. And that's going to do it for this episode, but before I sign off here, I want to... Um, I just want to mention that today marks the one-year anniversary of my brother's death. It's It's been a difficult week, not only for uh, me, but for my entire family. Uh, something like this, is just it's it's super hard to uh, to get over. But the reason I'm bringing this up is, is to drive this point home. If you or someone you know or love uh, is displaying tendencies that you think may be suicidal act do something talk to them talk to someone else call a hotline do something don't don't sit there and say oh it'll never happen to me or it'll never happen to so and so or or it's not that bad we all said the same thing so please 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 get help get that person help do something and I'm going to leave on that note uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I need to go through the spiel here. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Uh, I want to thank the wonderful Addie Lloyd and the amazing Warren Pond Abbott for their help uh, with this episode and every episode. All audio used in this, in this production has done so under the protection of fair use. And lastly, music from this episode was brought to you by Mayu and Coag Music. Thank you all for listening. And until next week.